very good evening to all our honorable speakers and moderators and our respected participants. Today, on the behalf of our organizers, I take the pleasure to welcome you all in the three-day international webinar, Spiritual Wellbeing and Stress Management, Religio-Psychological Perspectives, jointly organized by Bhakti Vedanta Research Center and Kolkata Society for Asian Studies. Before moving on to our four consecutive sessions of the day, I should refer Dr. Sumanta Rudra, Dean of Bhakti Vedanta Research Center, to kindly address all our participants with the inaugural speech. Thank you. Thank you, Shimanti. Over to you, sir. And thank you, Shimanti, and welcome to this three day webinar. I would like to thank you for all the organizers who have made this event happen. I also welcome all the audience who are joining this webinar across the world. This is being streamed live on YouTube. The Bhaktivedanta Research Center aims to be a leading research center and academic institute that is dedicated to preserving, researching, and disseminating the rich history, philosophy, and cultural heritage of Bengal. We have started 15 research projects under the guidance of erudite scholars of national and international repute. Our mission is to excel in qualitative research by distinguished national and international scholars in the diverse field of aesthetic, culture, comparative religion, history, and sociology. To offer accredited academic programs, including PhD, MA, diploma, and certificate courses in the above fields. To update, maintain research and the diverse collection of manuscript letters and memoirs. It is a great opportunity for BRC, Bhaktivedanta Research Center, to partner with Kolkata Kasas for this event. I do formally declare this event open and thank you very much. Thank you, Shimanti. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now I shall request our keynote speaker, Dr. Ferdinando Sardela, who is the assistant professor in the Department of Ethnology, History of Religions and Gender Studies in the Stockholm University. Sir, kindly sermon the keynote address. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, dear professors, researchers, students, and guests, welcome from Stockholm. Modern perspectives often support the scientific approach rooted in quantitative research strategies, evidence-based studies, and technical assessment of results. The trend is found in the established influence of the scientific methods. However, the biochemist and scientific researcher Rupert Sheldrake calls to suspend judgment and think again about the nature and its purpose. The world we live in today would be unimag unimaginable without the spectacular scientific advances in physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, and technology over the last few decades. As Sheldrake puts it, science has, quote, touched everyone's lives its intellectual prestige is almost unchall unchallenged. Its influence is greater than that of any other system of thought in all of human history." Unquote. Along with such achievements, however, comes challenges. A recent example of strong science was demonstrated in the well-known physicist from the University of Cambridge, now passed away, Stephen Hawking, with Leonard Mlodinow, they wrote the very popular book, The Grand Design, in 2010. The physicists set out to answer such questions, such as how does the universe behave? What is the nature of reality? And did the universe need a creator? They state that, quote, spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist, it is not necessary to invoke God to set the universe going." Unquote. They also assert, assert that traditionally these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly physics. 
The serious problems, though, beside various limitations of physics today, such as dark matter and dark energy, is the inability of natural science to solve some of the hard problems. One of them is matter as a source of cell and life. Another problem mentioned by Sheldrake is consciousness, which includes the failure to explain how the immaterial subjective experiences of conscious minds, such as inten intentions, feelings, values, wishes, dreams, and hopes, are possible. This is in a world which, according to a number of researchers of the natural sciences, consists only of material objects and processes, which can be reduced to physics and chemistry. The response of this scientific materialism to this dilemma is to deny the reality of consciousness. The neuroscientific data have till now not found a substantial central locus of consciousness in the brain. Thus, findings are still limited. Science and religion are closely interconnected today in the scientific study of religion in, for example, Europe and North America. Psychologists and sociologists, sociologists now commonly study religiosity as an independent variable of the mind with an impact on, for instance, health and social networks. Cognitive science of religion studies the rationality of religious belief as well. This is still limited to the mind rather than possible high level of transcendental consciousness, as for example found in Christian, Hindu, and Buddhist philosophy, but it gives a better theoretical meaning of the mind. Transcendental consciousness is still studied today in comparative history and philosophy of religion. Scientific studies of mind as well as religion, earlier mentioned, are increasing now in universities and colleges in India. To mention other positive research about the mind and consciousness with psychology, there is a short example mentioned by educator Professor Terry Highland. Chuck, Chuck, so, uh, Chaskalson has recently shown a range of persuasive arguments and evidence to prove how mindfulness training includes the enhancement of present awareness and attention. It can lead to the boosting of concentration, higher levels of emotional intelligence, and improved relationships. What Chaskalson calls the mindful workplace is characterized by, quote, higher overall levels of personal well-being and higher levels of creat creativity and innovation, unquote, for dealing with stress management. A major theme of this conference today is how we can cope with high stress problems such as COVID-19 through psychology, religion, spirituality, as well as mind and consciousness. This deals with complex challenges of an intransigent world in many levels that we are facing today. Faculties such as arts, humanities, and social sciences with institutions such as religion, psychology, psychology history, sociology, philosophy, cultural studies, and literature tend to develop a large variety of theories and perspectives for huge human challenges such as this. To end my short speech, I look forward to our conference of speakers with interfaith, dialogue, and discussion for new perspectives and understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your inspiring speech. Now, I shall request Dr. Shonvishtha De Basu, the secretary of the collaborating institution. Kolkata Society for Asian Studies to kindly deliver her welcome speech. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you. Hello, and very good evening to everyone. On behalf of Kolkata Society for Asian Studies, I am I am the secretary, uh, expressing my gratitude and hearty welcome to all the distinguished speakers, moderators distinguished guests, audiences, and the honorable dean, and all the organizing committee members of our co-partner, Bhakti Vedanto Research Center. As a social science-based organization, we always plan our program towards the developmental activities of the Asian communities, as we aim 
to carry out research program for planning and social welfare this is our pleasure to work in this joint venture towards spiritual well-being and stress management a religio psychological perspective religious beliefs and psychology are the two major wings of the social structure of mankind for understanding the social issues of the grassroots level we are organizing this webinar and collaborating with mukti vedanta research center so this attempt can integrally serve the interest of our society and the suggestions and discussions from eminent speakers resource persons will strengthen the mental power of people to fight against the morning stress and anxiety and depression at the end i wish to thank all the co advisory committee member of this webinar dr shantanu de dr kadinan bosharela dr shumanto rudro dr obhishek bos dr rudi sain dr sek mabul islam dr tini goshami dr shotobrot chakraborty dr ranjana roy and all thank you thank you ma'am so much now moving on to our first session of the day in our first session we have amongst us our speaker dr taputi mukherji and our st moderator dr shantanu de who is the associate professor in the department of history in ramkrishna mission vidya mandir belur math haura of west bengal i shall request sir to kindly introduce our eminent speaker and take over the session over to you sir thank you uh thank you shrimanti uh i am privileged to be a part of this three day international webinar which tries to reassess and unravel the two perhaps most discussed but least properly understood terms which are spiritual wellbeing and stress management the covid-19 pandemic has give, indeed given us all a rude external shock it has jolted us out of the normalcy we had become used to at the same time this external crisis has also hit us hard internally in terms of coping with this changed situation can our religious traditions offer us any hope for managing our internal disquiet in these uncertain times we should not forget that these traditions have evolved over thousands of years in the face of so many historical upheavals wars and social dislocations enshrined within them a whole range of, of diverse spiritual experiences so it is quite evident that our religious traditions can offer to us strategies and ways of tackling our internal mental emotional and spiritual predicaments hopefully this seminar will enable us to comprehend these issues in a better light so uh, before we begin uh, i also extend a very warm welcome to all our registered participants and request them to kindly write the questions that they have in mind to the speaker in the live youtube chat box uh, now i would go on to introduce the speaker Our first speaker of the day is Professor Tapati Mukherjee, a topper in Sanskrit from Calcutta University. Professor Mukherjee went on to complete her MPhil and PhD from Jadavpur University. She has had a, an illustrious career, both as an academician and as an administrator, with over 21 books and numerous articles to her credit. She has served in various positions. as principal of vijay krishna girls college haura as registrar of rabindra bharati university as the founder vice chancellor of sidukanu birsa university in purulia west bengal 
and she retired from Vishwa Bharati as director, culture and cultural relations, and as principal of Ravindra Bhavan Shantiniketan. At present, she is council member and library secretary, the Asiatic Society Kolkata, and also resident of the Sanskrit Shahito Porishad. The topic of her interest presentation today is the role of ancient Indian religious and philosophical texts in a pandemic devastated global scenario. I now request Professor Mukherjee to kindly deliver her speech. You have approximately around 30 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Day. Uh, Namaskar to all of you. At the outset, I convey my sincerest thanks and profound gratitude to the organizers of this particular webinar, which needless to say is very relevant in the present situation. We are passing through a crisis of unprecedented magnitude thrust upon us by a pandemic emanating from a hitherto unknown pathogen COVID-19. Almost half of the world is in isolation. Economy is in shambles. Millions of people have lost their job and livelihood. Education is in total disarray with all educational institutions closed for an indefinite period of time. Anxiety, uncertainty, a looming large leading to trauma, domestic violence, intolerance against your next door neighbor, even the medical practitioners who are in the frontline fighter in this fight against the pandemic. We are exasperated. We are depressed. We are disoriented and we are thoroughly clueless. Depression, disorientation and even suicidal tendency are on the rise throughout the world. So we are in a helpless situation, no doubt. But we cannot allow ourselves to be swayed away by this devastating pandemic. We have responsibility against towards our fellow citizens, our young generation. We have to sort out, we have to find out a solace, some way to increase our inner strength, to fight and overcome this peril. In this context, we may look back at our ancient Indian culture and heritage, at our ancient scriptural text to explore, to find out whether ancient Indian wisdom had any remedy, any suggestion, any suggestion left for the posterity about stress management through religio-philosophical deliberation. Incidentally, it may be mentioned here that both religion and ethics are expressed by a single term, dharma, in ancient Indian terminology. Now, what is precisely mentioned by the word stress? What is its actual meaning? It has been etymologically defined as a physical, chemical, or emotional factor.
Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Professor uh, Bukhari. Thank you. Oh, or mental tension and maybe a factor in disease causation. One, or one of bodily or mental tension resulting from factors that came to alter an existent equilibrium. Now, in our day-to-day -day life, we found we find stress triggered by some unfulfilled desire or ambition or a rat race to achieve the desired target or to cope with the situ cope with situation which is not under my control stress makes one depressed frustrated and even sick uncontrolled stress leads back even to suicidal tendencies it is quite obvious, obvious that in such a pandemic-stricken scenario, most of us are really under stress and it induces to look back to our ancient Indian predecessors. Now to start with, since its inception, Indian civilization had always emphasized all-round development of physical and mental faculties for a holistic development of an individual. The Vedic shears had always prayed for long lease of life of 100 years. Pashyema Sharadashatam. Jibema Sharadashatam. I shall see hundreds of autumn. I shall leave hundreds of autumn. The shears also perceived that this world as beautiful, blessed by pure and pure air, flowing rivers and abundance of plants. Madhubata ritayate madhuksharanti sindhavaha madhirna santoshadi. This is Rig Ved 196. The air, I, I translate it in simple English, the air sprinkles sweetness, so do the rivers. Let the plants also generate sweetness. But life is worth living when it is free from physical and mental agony and stress. So managing these symptoms is also necessary. The art is beautiful. Dust of art, this art is sweet. The Vedic shears also exemplify that the universe rotates in its own rhythm. Nothing detects or deters them from the cycle, thereby teaching us that life is precious. I draw your attention to this very pertinent point. Life is precious. Life is enjoyable, no matter what irritates us or gives us pain or agony life is always endearing life is always precious whatever pain or anxiety gives us trouble this will not last for long there is always some glimmer of light even in pitched darkness Chakravat Parivartante Sukhani Dukhani Cha. Like the wheel of a chariot, happiness and sorrow rotate. At the same time, a sense of solidarity, a bond of fellow feeling with the entire mankind was permeated in the verse of the Rig Veda, signifying thereby that one should not lose heart in any circumstance, however adverse it might be. And there is always a glimmer of light in a critical and adverse situation. Samani vah akuti, samana hridayani vah, samanastu yo mana, 
yathava susahati susahasati let your intention be same let your minds unite let your hearts unite let there be uniformly enough curiously enough in the 10th mandala of the rigveda we come come a him where a vishar or a doctor has been addressed to destroy the disease as all medical plants have assembled before him it is apparent therefore that the role of medication medical practitioner in eradic in erad eradicating disease had been recognized even in that very past presently when the doctors had been attacked even after the selfless service they are giving to the society even at the risk of their own lives we need to salute them and not push them into ignominy and this is the teaching of our most ancient scripture at a time when domestic violence is alarmingly on the rise we have because of an outcome of anxiety over livelihood even children at even children are not spared the message of vedic shares may be a silver lining in the black clouds which says let the son respect father let mother share same ties with the son let wife address husband with sweet and peaceful message it goes without saying that one is in the grip of stress when one perceives himself when one perceives himself to be lagging behind in competition with others to, to get rid of this unwanted feeling one may take recourse to our upanishads in the ishopanishad it has been categorically stated that one has to continue with his work and leave hundreds of years one should not get entangled for uh, uh, one should not get entangled in mad search for deci for decisive result of the work kurban neveh karwani ji ji vishet satang samaha evam tvai nanna theto asti na karma lipyate nare thus the idea of selfless work had been highlighted the message of the vedanta tat tvamasi thou art brahman eradicates all difference between the individual soul that is jivatman and infinite paramatman and as such a sense of identity with the entire universe blossoms in one's heart a sense of calm and serenity becomes permeated in our soul when we come across a verse in the ishopanishad again that the all pervasive eternal bliss has regulated all our actions and their fruits as per our attainments kabir manishi paribhu swayambhu jatha tat tatorthan badadha shashati bhyo samabhyo but more significant is the fact that the upanishadic shares seek complete identification of individual of universe and hence upholds the idea that when i am one with the entire universe then there is no scope of any sorrow any remorse any 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 enemical attitude towards others hatred towards others because there is hardly any difference between you and me between me and the entire universe jasmin sarvani bhutani atmai bahut vijanata tatra ko moha kashoka ekatvam anupashyata in a stressful situation one cannot enjoy beauty of this art or joys of the world for these people entangled in this unfortunate situation taittiriya upanishad 
has its message of encouragement anandam brahmeti vyajana ananda bhev khallivani bhutani jayante anande no jatani jivanti anandam prayanti avisang vishanti ti joy is eternal bliss from joy emanate all in living creatures they survive in joy and they are move one with joy so the message is come what may however adverse the situation is in whatever calamity you are try to be happy extract joy from smallest things around you but the most impressive instance of stress management in ancient text which can teach us a lesson in this arena even today after the lapse of several centuries is the message of gita the gita upholds the ways as to how to control stress effectively when arjuna finds his relatives friends and all near ones surrounding him in the war he felt distressed disoriented and was under terrible stress sidanti mama gatrani mukhancha parishushyati bepathushya sharire me romo hashashya jayate gandhi vam sramsate hasta tvakchaiva paridachyate kaanshe vijayam krishna nacharajyam sukhani cha my limbs are aching my mouth dries up my body is trembling my gandiva bow is falling down from my hand my skin is burning o oh krishna i do not want victory nor do i crave for kingdom or happiness in this at this crucial point in this crucial juncture sri krishna tried in his speech to distress him from this rough situation klaibyang masma gamah partha naitat tajjupapadyate khudram hridaya daurbalyam taktvatishtha parantapo do not get down partha with this stupor this is not befitting you get up immediately after eradic- eradicating all this weakness this tone of mild rebuke is absolutely essential to assist an individual to gain self confidence once again sri so krishna emphasized that life and death of all creatures are fixed and time bound but the more significant is the fact that one should not le- lose heart or get depressed for something that is predestined even in this present situation as it is predestined we should not lose heart tasmat aparihardye arthe natvam shochitum arthasi one should take happiness and sorrow profit and loss in the same spirit and thus there is no scope no space for depression or frustration sukha dukhe samekritva labha labham jaya jayo tato juddhaya jujvas naivam papam abakshasi the doctrine of nishkama karma or work without aspiration for result which has been preached by upanishad as a as has already been mentioned by me has found its most significant and poignant expression in the second chapter that is shanko yoga of gita karma neva adhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana you are supposed to do your work only and not crave for any result so gita advises us to come out of shackles of selfishness and continue work unabated without giving for result asakto hi acharan karma param apnoti purusha 
by less involvement in individual individualistic material prosperity one can control stress as universalism gains momentum in his output so the gita can be cited as a textbook of stress management because of its emphasis on universal welfare to be perpetrated by an individual lok sangraham evapi sankashan kottum arhasi to combat stress one should not brood over one's future one's fortune or misfortune he should take note of others who are equally hard hit and try to help them this intention to help others bahu jana hitaya bahu jana sukhaya will elevate one's mind and the soothing feeling will be comfortable for his irritated nerves gita also teaches us that in action and stress in action and stress does not help anyone to survive i repeat in action and stress does not help anyone to survive so so to continue work unabated will help one to overcome stress niyatam kuru karmatvam karmo jayo hi akarmana sharira jatra pite na prasiddhe akarmana to overcome stress gita's advice is to practice yoga which treats success and failure in the same way siddhi asiddhaya samo bhutva samattam योग उच्चते योग इज हेल्पफुल इन द कंटेम्पररी पर्सपेक्टिव एज योग डिफाइंड एज नथिंग बट स्किल फॉर ए पर्टिकुलर वर्क योग कर्मसु कौशलम इन द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ स्ट्रेस मैनेजमेंट प्रेजेंट डे स्ट्रेस मैनेजमेंट टैक्टिक्स अनदर ट्रिटी ऑफ एंशिएंट इंडिया नीड्स मेंशन दैट इज योग सूत्र ऑफ पतंजलि अष्टांग योग is an ancient system which helps mind to combat discursive or negative thought practice of yoga is a helpful method of nurturing and developing your body your mind your intellect and soul this yoga has seven constituents yoma niyamasana pranayama प्रत्याहार ध्यान ध्यान समाधेयो अष्टो अंगान व्हाट इज यमो दैट इज रेस्ट्रेन नॉन वायलेंस ट्रुथफुलनेस नॉन स्टीलिंग राइट यूज ऑफ एनर्जी एंड अपोरिट ग्रह नॉन ग्रीड और नॉन होर्डिंग ऑल दिस कंबाइंड मेक यमो और रेस्ट्रेन देन कम्स नियमो रेगुलेशन क्लीनलीनेस contentment discipline study of scriptures and surrender to god all these constitute niyama or regulation then comes asana steady and comfortable position of the body it helps us to regulate disturbing passions and control our emotions by strengthening our my our nervous system it less to say that it is very helpful for stress management then pratyahara detraction pratyahara means withdrawal of senses from their respective objects pratyahara protects us from emotional turbulences which are caused by continuous worldly inputs next come the most discussed one nowadays that is pranayama equipoise of respiration control of breath it not only works at physical level but also assists in emotional management the sixth one is dharana retention refers to training of the mind to focus on a particular object the seventh one is dhyana meditation it also meditation also helps to get rid of negative thoughts and the last one is samadhi absorption a stage of perfect calm of mind so the practice of ashtanga yoga 
or at least a few of it constituents helps one to have peace of mind and respite from stress to conclude admittedly our ancient shears and philosophers are not psychiatrists and psychologists in the modern sense of the term but prudent and wise as they were they could realize that stress or surge of negative feelings occasionally cripple human mind and they tried to find their solutions both from philosophical religious and practical point of view the concept of oneness with the eternal bliss paramatman the doctrine of war without aspiration aspire without aspiring for result kalakanksha rahita karma are remedial measures to overcome stress from philosophical point of view whereas ashtanga yoga emphasizes the practical remedies as well we are indeed fortunate that ancient indian wisdom in that very past thousands of years ago could identify the underlying causes of stress and suggested remedies measures which are still valid which are still relevant even in contemporary perspective let us therefore pray for a world free from elements and stress from anxieties from turmoil created by this pandemic and many other extraneous and intricate reasons which has destroyed our mental peace our mental equilibrium and our mental happiness let us repeat let us repeat the words of our shears once again sarve bhavantu sukhinah sarve santu niramaya sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashchit dukha bhag bhave let there be happiness let all be happy let all be free from disease let all see what is good what is beneficial for all let there be let no sorrow no unhappiness afflict anyone in the future and the present thank you all I I can't hear you. Please be louder, please. The ah, first question. Sorry. Can you uh, hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Uh, can you hear me? Now the first. Yes. Ah uh, yes, I can hear you yes. now. The first question is yes. about. charbaka philosophy now charbaka philosophy yes. is absolutely a materialistic philosophy jabat bibet sukham jibet rinam krithwa bhritam pibe so long as you are alive you enjoy life and after that after that nothing remains uh, so in that way uh, charbaka philosophy also helps us to be happy in that way so if you interpret it in that way that it uh, bolsters happiness it wants happiness to be happy in the world is the primary objective of charbaka philosophy so to be happy one has to overcome stress so it is uh, embedded in the philosophy itself the 
second question is also from charbak and this is from tinni i suppose tinni i think i have answered your query that if you interpret charbak of philosophy in that way though it is a bit materialistic philosophy and it does not come under the purview of six astika darshan darshan shanko jog nyam boisheshik purva mimangsha uttar mimangsha but even then it is a very important school of indian philosophy and since it hops on material happiness so to get material happiness also one has to overcome stress and the third one is how can we approach to bring up an institute of takkoshila stacher vedic studies should be for everyone without considering it sectarian now at one point of time vedic studies is was not allowed to non brahmins and christians professor shukumari bhattacharya had drawn of sanskrit education has been denied because she was a christian but nowadays universities has universities have kept their door ajar for all whether you are a christian or a hindu or a muslim it hardly matters i have many students from muslim community who have done very well in their honors and uh, uh, honors and um, masters examination so nowadays the door of vedic studies is open to all it is always desirable to have a, a vedic institute we have already one in rabindra bharati university for your information school of vedic studies is there that is for uh, absolutely dedicated to vedic studies i think i have answered your query anything yes, else perfectly well uh, professor mukherjee ah. yes thank you professor taputi mukherjee for outlining in a very succinct manner from your very uh, vast in fact knowledge of literary sources uh, the way in which our ancient indian religious and philosophical traditions have prescribed a resilient approach towards life uh, so i found your uh, lecture very interesting indeed as we all understand life presents us difficulties problems challenges and opportunities how our mind reacts to external situations obviously it is either negative way or in a positive manner in fact that is what ultimately determines our approach to life as well in fact as you correctly pointed out the upanishadic understanding that every human being is made up of various layers the muscular layer the layer of the nervous system the layer of the psychic consciousness and finally the self or the atman is essential to realizing how our mind functions the cycle of sanskaras or subtle impressions of our past actions that we have inculcated give rise to vrittis or thoughts which come up like bubbles in our lake like mind and it is as extremely essential for each of us to latch on to those vrittis which are positive unselfish and welfare oriented in order to transform the way in which our mind works so thank you so much for your presentation in fact it was good that you pointed out the fact that krishna's sermons to arjun was happening on a field of war in an extraordinary emergency and this gives us hope that even in this pandemic situation we still have hope and our ancient scriptures in fact tell us this secret so thank you so much and we shall uh, i think the first session has come to an end thank you so much i give the mic to shrimati thank you sir thank you ma'am it was such an enlightening session and uh, summation was also very enriching in our second session we are moving on in our second session we have amongst us dr mans bru i shall kindly request our moderator dr shantanu dey sir to introduce our second esteemed speaker and take over the session thank you yeah thank you shrimanti once again and uh, we now move on to the second session our speaker for this session is dr mons brew dr brew is a senior lecturer in the department of comparative religion at abo academy university finland and is also a research fellow at the oxford center for hindu studies in the united kingdom his main research interests include yoga both in its historical forms as well as in its contemporary 
forms and the intersections between Vaishnavism and Tantricism in pre-modern Bengal. His recent publications include Finnish and Swedish translations of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and the award-winning Radha Tantra critical text and annotated translation, which was published from Routledge, Univers Routledge uh, in 2017. Dr. Brew is also uh, the editor of the Finnish yoga magazine Ananda and a practitioner of yoga himself. The topic of his very interesting presentation today is titled Yoga as a Spiritual Path, Some Notes from Finland. I request Dr. Brew to kindly deliver his address. You have around 30 minutes or so for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shantanu, Shantanuda, my respect, uh, Dr. Shantanu Day. I'm very happy to be here in uh, your company. We are living through this uh, Corona days, so I haven't been able to come to India for what seems an eternity, but uh, being like this, at least virtually in your company, is giving me some solace. So I'm very happy to be here, and I, I hope that I will be able to contribute in uh, my own little modest way to this seminar. My topic today is yoga as a spiritual path, some notes from Finland. So what I would like to do today is uh, speak about uh, yoga, the practice of yoga, and how that is understood here in my country, Finland, uh, by ordinary yoga practitioners. We have just heard a very enlightening talk about uh, uh, yoga and so on uh, from the topic of, of literature. Today, I'm not going to, to do that. Instead, I'm going to speak about this topic from the point of view of practitioners, not necessarily elite practitioners, teachers, acharyas, gurus, and so on, but ordinary practitioners of yoga in my country. This, of course, will not give us the same kind of information as we just heard, but uh, it might still be of some interest because uh, studies of spirituality, studies of religion, and so on, are today more and more focused not only on the texts, not only on the big uh, teachers, on the men, but uh, more and more on ordinary people. So this will be my, my focus for today. But let me begin with uh, a mantra. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Obhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvina Vadhita Mastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Yoga is uh, held to be a spiritual path, both, of course, in the ancient texts and amongst people today. If there's something that uh, everybody can agree on, it is that yoga is not gymnastics. Yoga is not simply some kind of Indian exercise. It is not simply a physical culture. Rather, it is something more. What this something more means, people will have very different opinions about that. But they will would prefer to use a word like spiritual. Now, the word spiritual, in many ways, is a convenient word today. We live in a world where people are afraid of the world religion. The reasons for why people are afraid of the word religion, of course, differ. In India, there's the ever-present threat of communalism. Uh, here in Finland, which is a majority Lutheran Christian country, that threat is not present. But rather, 
people are afraid of the word religion because they very often uh, link the word religion with something that is uh, uh, backwards, that belongs maybe to our grandparents' generation. And uh, that has little relevance in today's complicated world. So religion is almost like a dirty word. If you say that something is religious, it seems to uh, lose its relevance. Instead, the word spirituality, people like better. When you ask ordinary people what the difference between religion and spirituality is, of course, you will get many different kinds of answers. But a very common, uh, commonly articulated difference is that religion is about what other people tell you to do. And spirituality is about what I decide for myself. Now, of course, uh, this is not... Uh, the same kind of dichotomy as, as you'll find in, in, for example, in the Bengali language, where people often make a difference between dharma and oddat mikata or, or similar, similar terms. But it's somewhat similar. Just like dharma often is held to be external, duties imposed by uh, family, by caste, by sex, by age. Uh, religion is held to be something imposed by outer authorities. Spirituality, instead, is held to be something that is intrinsic and something that is voluntary. This idea of uh, uh, voluntariness, this idea of being able to choose for oneself of course, is a very powerful ideal in today's world, not only in Finland, but in an internet on an international scale. So, uh, in Finland, people like to to uh, link yoga with spiritual uh, advancement and and a spiritual path. But what does this mean when we approach people and really ask them, when we put this question to them? What do you mean by spirituality? We've done this. As uh, our respected moderator just, just told you, uh, apart from being a, a teacher at the university and uh, uh, a practitioner of yoga myself, I'm also the editor of a yoga magazine called Ananda. This is, uh, we like to think so ourselves at least, the, the best yoga magazine in Finland. Uh, it's at least the most, most read one. And uh, in our magazine, a few years back, we did a survey. We sent out uh, to all the subscribers of the magazine uh, a survey. We did this survey uh, together with uh, the Department of Religious Studies at my university, Obo Academy University, and uh, the Church Research Institute, which is a, a large research institute connected with the Evangelical Lutheran Church here in Finland, but doing research not only about Christianity, but many kinds of research connected with religion and spirituality in Finland. And what we wanted to find out in this, re in this survey were many different things connected with yoga in Finland. Because as surprising as it might sound to you, Finland is actually one of the countries in the world where yoga is most popular. In terms of absolute numbers, India, of course, is by far the largest country of yogis. Nowhere in the world will you find as many yoga practitioners as in India. But if you do not look at absolute numbers, but rather as uh, uh, yoga practitioners in terms of percentage of the population, Finland is actually uh, among the top 10 countries. 
perhaps even the top five. Uh, the reasons for the, this uh, are various historical reasons. Yoga came to Finland first in the beginning of the 20th century, together with the theosophical movement. And then gradually different types of what Elisabeth de Michelis appositely calls modern postural yoga came to Finland. Yoga, of course, is a phenomenon, phenomenon is manifold and can be divided into many different uh, types of yoga. The kind of yoga uh, lived in, for example, the ISKCON movement is very different from the type of yoga taught at the com modern commercial yoga school. But if we think of yoga here as postural yoga, the kind of yoga that is mostly focused on the, the physical exercises of asana, pranayama, and so on, then uh, a larger interest for this kind of yoga grew up in Finland towards the end of the 1960s. Instrumental here were uh, some yogis from India, but also yoga practitioners from other European countries, such as Gerald Blitz from France. And uh, yoga soon became uh, popular in Finland as a form of physical exercise a kind of gentle uh, physical exercise that is suitable for everybody, regardless of age or physical condition. And yoga also became part of uh, uh, secondary education. Yoga became a, uh, a topic and, and uh, uh, something that was taught in different kinds of uh, vocational schools, different kinds of of uh, evening schools and so on throughout Finland, which made yoga very popular, not only in the metropolitan areas, but also uh, in rural areas. The reason for why this was possible, uh, there were many reasons for it. One was that yoga uh, and this interest coincided with uh, an interest in Eastern cultures, Eastern spiritualities, but also that yoga had been consciously marketed as a non-religious type of exercise and spirituality. And this is my main, and my first main point for tonight. It is said that the good lecturer should never have more than three points in the lecture if he wants to keep his audience. So I'll try to keep the three. This is my first. When we say that yoga is a spiritual path, regardless of whether we're speaking of, of Finland, as I'm doing right now, or if we're speaking more generally, uh, spiritual needs to be understood as in some way detached from traditional religious systems. Even in a country as secularized, as little religious as Finland is today, if yoga there back in the 60s, if it had been explicitly linked to Hinduism, if it had been explicitly linked with uh, Vedanta philosophy or any other direct form of a foreign religion, people would have backed away. That would have been too scary, too weird, too different. Rather, choosing to portray yoga as a spiritual path instead of as a religious path, yoga teachers, yoga practitioners were able to create a kind of neutral background for yoga. Now, how neutral yoga really was in the 1960s and after that uh, is, of course, debatable. Uh, yoga practitioners in Finland uh, studied the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. They studied the Bhagavad Gita. They studied the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. Uh, they traveled to India. Uh, many of them uh, became vegetarians. 
I tried to adopt a somehow a yogic lifestyle that had many things in common with uh, the kind of teachings that had been popularized in the West by teachers such as Swami Vivekananda. But explicitly, yoga was not linked to Hinduism. Now, the end of the 60s, the start of the 70s, up to the 80s, up to the very last years of the 80s and the first years of the 1990s, yoga was in Finland mostly popularized and mostly practiced uh, but in, in, in a way that was led by uh, what we could say amateurs in the sense that yoga was not a commercial enterprise. You could, you could go to yoga classes paying uh, just a very small fee and you could take yoga classes in, in, uh, in some ordinary school in the evenings when all the kids were away. They, they would arrange things in the evening for, for adults and yoga could be one of them. In Finland, it's only in the early 90s that yoga, a new kind of wave of postural yoga comes, which is urban in a distinction to the previous one, which was found both in the urban and rural, rural uh, areas. So this new wave of yoga beginning in the 90s was, was, was specifically urban. And it was also commercial in the sense that commercial actors started teaching yoga, founding explicitly yoga schools, focusing only on yoga, where you would, you would pay for a membership, you would pay maybe monthly, and then you could take yoga classes. Uh, this had its, its upsides and its downsides, we could say. Yoga became, uh, uh, by being more professionalized, Teachers were also able to focus only on teaching yoga instead of doing that only as a hobby on the side of their ordinary job, which meant, of course, that the quality of the teachers rose. Uh, yoga also became uh, uh, started to be seen as something for, for young people, particularly fit young people, uh, hip young people, Walking around with a yoga mat on your shoulder was, uh, uh, and still is, a fashionable thing. Uh, gradually, things like Instagram yoga, uh, this kind of, of uh, fashionable young people taking pictures of themselves, doing yoga, sharing that as a part of their lifestyle, became popular. But what is interesting is that even among these people that all the practitioners of yoga often criticize as being very shallow or, or not re really knowing what yoga is actually about, even among these people, uh, yoga is connected with spirituality. So when we did our survey some years back about yoga here in Finland, all kinds of yogis participated. These uh, older yogis, also the younger urban yogis. And one of the things we asked people in this survey was, uh, why do you do yoga? Why do you engage in yoga? Many yoga practitioners in Finland have a, a great dedication towards yoga. Finnish people in general are, are held to be, be a dedicated type of people. If we decide to do something, we stick to it. And uh, there are lots of yoga people in Finland that uh, uh, use even up to two hours every day for their yoga practice. Ordinary people who then after that go to work, who study do different things, have a family and so on. They can be quite successful in the ordinary world, but they are dedicated to the yoga practice. So why do these people do yoga? Most people answered, uh, gave very, what we could say, uh, inner-worldly 
even the mundane reasons for why they were doing yoga. They would say that they're doing yoga for the sake of uh, relaxation. Uh, or they could say that they are doing yoga because they want to uh, uh, get rid of the stress they're feeling. Or they could say that they're doing yoga because of uh, some uh, uh, ailment they're having. They're having a problem with their back, for example, and they're trying to get relief for that from yoga. So there were many of this type of, of, kind, of kind of inner worldly. Uh, mundane reasons for yoga. People who said that they're doing yoga for religious reasons, there are, after all, uh, Hindu practitioners of yoga in Finland as well. Uh, there are also different types of, of uh, Christian yoga and so on, uh, with few and far between. There were just a few people who said that they're doing yoga for religious reasons. But there was a, a fair amount of people who said that they're doing yoga for a spiritual reason. So what did they mean by this spiritual? What does it mean when we say that yoga is a spiritual path? This is an important question because uh, it demonstrates to us how these terms that we can take for granted, what does spirituality mean? What does religion mean? are actually not at all very well defined. And uh, they're not at all very clearly understood by people. Our uh, informants in this survey, they connected spirituality with uh, various things in life that are not so easily uh, grasped things that cannot easily be, be measured. For example, uh, feelings of satisfaction, feelings of contentment. A spiritual experience could be uh, going to see, going to a, 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 an opera, going to a concert, and... Uh, feeling uplifted or feeling uh, happy afterwards. So uh, when people were saying, were, were thinking of yoga as a spiritual path, they usually meant that yoga for them is something that makes them feel better with themselves. Here in Finland, as I'm, I'm sure everywhere in the world today, most yoga practitioners uh, are not men, but women. This is, of course, might come as a, as a shock to, to men like me who think that yoga is something that is found in old books. When you, we look at uh, yoga in real life, in uh, yoga studios, for example, around the world, in India as well, uh, many of the practitioners are, are women. And many of the issues uh, connected with yoga for these, these uh, practitioners are connected to the same kind of issues that women are facing uh, everywhere in the world. Feelings of uh, being uh, not being uh, good enough in different ways, not having the a body good enough, not being uh, as full of uh, energy, as full of confidence, as full of of whatever as as imagined that uh, is needed. So many of the women in our survey, most of the, the the participants in our survey were women in their early forties. So not very young women but uh, women entering into the middle age of life. For most of them, that yoga was a spiritual uh, path meant that it was a part of uh, learning to uh, understand oneself and see oneself in this world in uh, a more compassionate way. People in general 
I'm sure not only in Finland, but many, many places of the world, are not very compassionate to each other, but they are particularly not compassionate towards themselves. Uh, perhaps Finland is a bit extreme in this sense, but, but especially here, it's very common for people to be dissatisfied with themselves. I can see that uh, in my, myself as well. I, I, I tend to compare myself, for example, with my late father, who was greater than me in every way, and uh, feel myself as being, being a, a lesser son of a greater sire. And people are li like this very often in Finland. We may not compare ourselves to our fathers, but we will compare ourselves to, to our colleagues, our friends and others, and feel that we are not good enough. So for many people, yoga is a way of, through the physical exercises, getting to know the body, getting to know one's own body, literally seeing one's own toes, for example, seeing the feeling, the different parts of the body that one hasn't been so acquainted with from, uh, from before, and learning to accept oneself. Yes, I may not be the most muscular man in the world. I may not meet, be the leanest or I may not be the most acrobatic man in the world. But this is how I am. This is the kind of body I have. And this is what I have to deal with. And this is what I have to live with. Getting out on the yoga mat, doing the yoga practices day after day, when one feels like it, when one doesn't feel like it. Many practitioners felt that this was a way of getting to know oneself, getting to know one's body, but also getting to know one's own mind. Because the dedicated practitioner will notice quite soon that sometimes you feel like doing the practice, sometimes you don't. But when you're standing there on the yoga mat and you feel like, today I don't want to do my practice, what will you do? You're standing there in the yoga school, you've paid for the yoga class, standing there wearing your yoga clothes on your yoga mat, surrounded by other people. Finnish people are shy people. So it's too late to back away at that point when you're standing there in the middle of the room. You don't feel like doing the practice, <sighs> but anyway, let's start. And then you start your sun salutations. And after a while, uh, the practice kind of carries you through when you notice that actually, I may not have been so enthusiastic from the beginning, but uh, it's quite nice anyway. And afterwards, it always feels like you did something good. So, uh, and the same, of course, applies to the days when you're really feeling great. Today, I want to do my practice. Whether your practice is uh, asana practice or meditation practice or japa practice or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. You feel like you want to do it. You feel like you don't want to do it. You still get down to it and you do the practice. This kind of dedicated practice of course, teaches detachment from the mind, just as the physical practice teaches detachment and, and, and acceptance of the body. Yes, might not be the best body, but this is what I have. It's quite good enough. Similarly, uh, working with the mind, working with overcoming the mind, teaches detachment from the mind. Yes, my mind is a crazy one. My mind feels like a teenager whenever I tell it, do your yoga practice. The mind says, no, 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 not today. I feel so tired. I feel so worn out. Maybe I, <coughs> I have a little bit of a flu. <coughs> Probably it's Corona. No, you still get down to doing the practice. So uh, these kind of things where uh, 
affiliated with yoga by our survey respondents. Spirituality as meaning learning to accept the body, learning to accept the mind, but at the same time also to kind of take a step back. Not being bogged down by the body, not being bogged down by the mind. Now, there are many of us who are dedicated practitioners of some spiritual path or religious path, whether that is that taught by, by Paramahamsa Ramakrishna or by Chaitanya Deb or uh, whatever other spiritual path or religious path. When we hear spirituality defined in such a vague, uh, general way as by these Finnish yoga practitioners, uh, we might feel disappointed. It should be something more, shouldn't it? Not just learning to get along with the body and the mind. Yes, we might think like this. And uh, personally, if I'd be asked the personal question, I would also agree with that. Yoga is something more than that. But this is the kind of things that people brought out in our survey. And I thought they were interesting because uh, they say something about uh, yoga on kind of a, uh, a ground platform. Uh, I don't have that much, much time left, but I want to bring up one last point. My first point was uh, spirituality is uh, uh, often a strategic tool to speak about st spirituality instead of speaking about religion can be a, a, a strategic tool to reach out to to people uh, in larger in a larger audience my second point was that the words and the concepts of spiritual and religion spiritual and religious uh, vary in different contexts I know from a, a project that we have doing, been doing in, in Bengal together with uh, Professor Ruby Shine that uh, there are lots of people in, in West Bengal who take it as a self-evident dichotomy to, to differentiate between, for example, dharma and odotmikota. But there are also lots of people, particularly Muslims, in West Bengal who do not see such a difference and who think that it would be silly to speak about dharma as separate from oddotmikata if these uh, Sanskritic terms even mean anything to them. So we shouldn't take for granted that everybody will divide the world according to the same conceptual tools as uh, we are cost uh, accustomed to from uh, a Western or, or, or at least English uh, language background. So uh, uh, that was the second point. And the third point is that uh, when people then uh, become interested in yoga as a spiritual path, uh, they will go looking for more information in different uh, directions, one of which will be the what we could call a, a Hindu background, uh, exploring the teachings of various Hindu teachers. Uh, but oftentimes uh, other backgrounds as well. Much of the teachings uh, found in today's yoga world uh, are not directly from any Indian scriptures or Indian teachers. Much of the things that people know about the so-called chakras, the seven chakras of, of the human body, are things that were popularized and, and invented by, by C.G. Jung, the, the uh, 20th century thinker. So uh, uh, when yogis want to, yoga practitioners want to explore the spiritual side of yoga, they do not always turn towards India. There are also many other things that they get interested in from a vaguely defined kind of spiritual milieu 
which takes inf uh, inspiration from India, but also from other places. So these were the three things I wanted to, to tell you today. Uh, speaking from the, this particular case in uh, what I'm sure for you is a very exotic country far away in the north, but uh, which I hope can serve in some ways also to illustrate global trends. Now we have some sure, sure. questions here. Uh, the first question is, I would like yes, to know... Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Should I read yeah, my please, please go ahead. We have two okay. or three questions. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can read it out for you. But, uh, okay, sure. but let me first thank you uh, so much, Mons, for your uh, informed views on the historical spread and the nature of uh, activities related to yoga, which are happening in Finland. So thank you for that. But uh, as you pointed out before coming to the questions, uh, indeed, posture based uh, yoga practices obviously uh, have their relevance. And these have found acceptance in the West, not just in Finland, as you say, but all across the West uh, from the late 19th or early 20th century onwards. Now, the regular practice of yoga not only brings flexibility and balance to the body, we all know about that, but it also cleanses the mind, which is uh, what you stated in your presentation as well. Uh, in fact, today, uh, we would be surprised that all across the West, in different supermarkets and uh, shopping malls, we have yoga mats and yoga blocks and foam rollers being sold. So this is something which is a testimony of the fact to the fact that the yoga has become a global phenomenon today. Now, uh, the marketing and commercialization of yoga, as you say, as a global concept has obviously led to certain changes in its essential character. Because as you have yourself pointed out that yoga in Indian traditions, however, is much more than merely physical exercise. It has a meditative and spiritual core to it. In fact, yoga, as you know very well, it represents one of the six major orthodox schools of Hinduism, apart from Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Mimamsa, and Vedanta. And it has its own epistemology, ontology, and metaphysics. Uh, so given this situation that uh, yoga in Indian traditions is theistically grounded, uh, how far do you think, in fact, before coming to the questions which have been posed to you, uh, let me just uh, give my uh, question to you. Uh, now, what kind of subtle differences do you find uh, in, the, in the practice of yoga today in your country and the way in which it was perceived in Indian traditions, for, for instance, in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Thank you for this question. This is, of course, a, <laughs> a huge question. What is the difference? There are so many differences. And, and of <laughs> course, this reflects the fact that yoga has never been a, a single monolith. We speak about the Yoga Sutra, for example. But if we yeah. look at the teachings of of the great yoga teachers of India of the 20th century, such as Krishna Macharya, Shivananda, and so on. None of them really base their teaching on, right. on the philosophy of Patanjali. Swami Hariharananda Aranya, the Bengali saint, uh, he did. He called himself a Sankhya Yogin, but he's alone in that. So uh, the reason for why uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra is, is still uh, considered a, a classic within the yoga world is connected with uh, Swami Vivekananda's uh, early translation of it uh, in his Raja Yoga book uh, and his popularization of the book. So right. I would say that the differences between uh, uh, ancient yoga and, and modern yoga are, are, are very numerous. But what I find interesting is that uh, this mm. kind of what we could call maybe Western yoga uh, is becoming more and po more popular in India as well. You have the same kinds of yoga studios in India as uh, we have in the West today in, in urban India. And I find this to be a very interesting uh, demonstration of the kind of cultural currents 
happening in the world today where where things come from India, yeah. they go to the West, they get transformed, and then they go back to India and uh, and continue being transformed in, mm -hmm. in new ways. Uh, so I'll just quickly quickly answer the the, yes, the yes. questions here. Uh, gender bias. Other questions. Uh, yeah. And yoga. In fact, That's one of the, the questions. Yes. Can I have two questions? You think? Yeah. Sure. Uh, sure. Well, sure. Two or three questions will be good. Yeah. Well, uh, if we look at Patanjali, he doesn't say anything about gender. Uh, he's taking it for granted that his audience is uh, is a male audience we could say but but he doesn't say anything particular that would prohibit uh, women from from doing yoga uh, we do see in later yoga texts uh, a more explicit emphasis on on the male body such as in the in the hatha yoga pradipika these these practices of uh, Vajroli and and so on. They are are practices can, that can only be done uh, with a male body. But uh, even there, there's no explicit uh, uh, prohibition for for uh, for women uh, engaging in different kinds of, of yoga. And now I'm only speaking about kind of physical uh, postural yoga. Uh, so yeah. so yes, in this sense, we could we could say that it's 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 neutral. Then uh, uh, the second question is, at what point while practicing yoga do we experience the spiritual aspect of it? Well, that, of course, is very much based on, on the individual. If you look at the Gita, for example, Krishna speaks about uh, pur the, the power of purva bhyasa, the power of, of previous practice. He says in the sixth adhyaya of the Gita that the person who has not become perfected in uh, his or her yoga practice will uh, take birth in a, in the family of of yogis and then continue the practice where he or she left it off so for such a person we could expect that the spiritual aspect would come very soon and of course we see that there are people who engage in yes. yoga for years and the only thing they are worried about is whether the blood pressure is going down and then there mm -hmm. are others who start engaging in yoga the next week they start being interested in the Gita and so on. So this is very individual. We, ca we cannot say that it's the same for everybody. It's depending on, on their background, we could say. And, and from a modern sociological perspective, we could say that it's depending also on the kind of, of socialization they are getting into yoga, what, what is the emphasis given. Finally, uh, from, from Dr. Goswami, uh, how is the corporate world in Finland responding towards yoga to give relief to it, the, its employees? Yes, the, uh, some uh, companies are, are offering yoga as, as kind of uh, employee recreation. The same is true uh, for, for various types of mindfulness, mindfulness uh, practices that have their, their origin in, in Buddhism, but are popularized by the works of Yon Kabat-Zinn. Uh, so uh, uh, yes, companies are, are uh, favorably inclined towards both yoga and mindfulness. And again, part of this is because yoga has been uh, separated from its uh, religious roots, so that uh, companies that would find it uh, improper or, or strange to offer something that would be considered religious because yes. they're secular companies would not have an issue about offering yoga because yoga is not in the popular mind connected with religion in today's film. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so we uh, thank you once again, Mons. Uh, and uh, uh, we come to the end of the second session. And uh, now I'll uh, hand over the mic to Srimanti. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shantanu, sir. Thank you, Dr. Bro. Thank you, sir. Thank you for letting us experience such an educative session. Now we are moving on to our third session. The speaker for our third session is Shami Mahamedhanando Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj and our reputed moderator is Dr. Sheikh Magbul Islam. 
Dr. Sheikh Makbul Islam is the director of Jagannath Research Center and an associate in the Department of Bengali of St. Paul Cathedral's College, Kolkata. I would request Sir Dr. Sheikh Islam to kindly introduce our speaker and take over the session. Thank you. Over to you, Sir. Okay. Namaskar. So this is a very auspicious occasion uh, because the BRC, Bhakti Vedanta Research Center and Kolkata Society for Asian Studies together trying to find out a way how we can cope up with the COVID situation uh, from the perspective of spirituality. <clears throat> so by this time, we already have listened to two different important lectures. Our next speaker now is revered Swami Mahamedhanandaji Maharaj. I would like to introduce him. Swami Mahamedhanandaji is a sannyasi of Sri Ramakrishna Mahat and Sri Ramakrishna Mission, a monastic order centered around Sri Ramakrishna Paramhansa established by Swami Vivekananda in 18. 97. He has been involved in value, value education activities for the last two decades. Initially, he served in Belur Mutt, the headquarters of the order, and then for nine years, he served in Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandir, a fully residential UG to PhD college for men in Howrah, Belur Mutt, Howrah, West Bengal as a hostel superintendent, and he also acted as joint controller of examination. From August 2016, he is serving as the editor of the reputed, most reputed journal Vedanta Keshari, a cultural and spiritual monthly English magazine published from Ramakrishna Mission, Ramakrishna Mart Chennai. He is the mentor of students of Vivekananda Study Circle, IIT, Madras. He is going to talk about facing the pandemic challenge the Vivekananda's way. So by this time, we have listened uh, the Indian philosophical perspective. So now we are going to, from the perspective of yoga, now I request, I welcome Revered Maharaj to please uh, present your speech on Swami Vivekananda's perspective. Namaskar. Uh, please. Am I audible now? Yes. Yes, now it is okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very nice, kind introduction, Professor. And I'm happy to see you after a long time. I remember our association in Vidya Mandir. I'll begin by narrating two incidents uh, from the life of uh, Swami Vivekananda. The first is when Swami Ramakrishna is uh, conversing with Zamindas, the Nanda brothers. The one of the brothers there he complains about partiality by God. There is no justice in this creation. So many people are suffering, so many are happy, and things like that. Then Sri Ramakrishna replies. But God Himself has become everything, the universe and its living beings. You will realize it when you have perfect knowledge. 
God himself has become the 24 cosmic principles. The mind, intellect, body and so forth. Is there anyone but himself to whom he can show partiality? Then the Zamindar again questions. Why has he assumed all these different forms? Why are some wise and some ignorant? Sri Ramakrishna. It is his sweet will. The Divine Mother is full of bliss. Creation, preservation and destruction are the waves of her sportive pleasure. Now the Zamindar says, it may be her sweet will, but it is death to us. Then Sri Ramakrishna asks a fundamental question. But who are you? It is a Divine Mother who has become all this. It is only so long as you do not know her that you say, I, I. And as long as we say, I, I, we continue to suffer. The second incident is when Sri Ramakrishna was lying seriously ill with throat cancer at Kasipur. One day, Pandit Shashadar Tarka Chudamani came to see Sri Ramakrishna. And he told, scriptures declare that a great yogi like you, if he will concentrate his mind on wherever the disease is, that disease will be cured. So he asked Sri Ramakrishna, please put your mind on this throat cancer, it will be cured. At this, Sri Ramakrishna replied, for a scholar like you to make such a proposal, how can I withdraw the mind from the lotus feet of God and turn it to this worthless cage of flesh and blood? The Pandit left, but then Narain, later Swami Vekananda, and other young disciples, they said, please pray to the Divine Mother to cure you. Sri Ramakrishna replied, but I cannot pray for my body. Then Narendra insisted, you must do it for our sake, at least for our sake. And Sri Ramakrishna's love for Narain was unbounded. So Sri Ramakrishna replied, very well, I shall try. A few hours later, Narain came back and he asked Sri Ramakrishna, what happened? Then Sri Ramakrishna replied, I said to the mother, mother, I cannot swallow food because of my pain. Make it possible for me to eat a little. Then mother pointed out you all to me and said, what? You are eating enough through all these mouths, isn't that so? I was ashamed and could not utter another word. That was the end of the conversation about curing Sri Ramakrishna's disease to yogic powers. Advaita Vedanta tells us that our sense of separate individuality is the source of all our sufferings. There is death, there is cancer, there is everything else. But the suffering is because I have a separate individuality. And realizing our true nature as consciousness is the only answer to these experiences of suffering. I will now quote Swami Vivekananda, which is relevant to this point. Quote, if it is happiness to enjoy the consciousness of this small body, it must be greater happiness to enjoy the consciousness of two bodies. The measure of happiness increasing with the consciousness of an increasing number of bodies. The aim, the ultimate of happiness being reached when it would have become a universal consciousness. Therefore, to gain this infinite universal individuality, this miserable little prison individuality must go. Then alone can death cease when I am alone with life. Then alone can misery cease when I am one with happiness itself. Then alone can all error cease when I am one with knowledge itself. And this is the necessary scientific conclusion. Science has proved to me that physical individuality is a delusion, that really, my body is one little continuously changing body in an unbroken ocean of matter. And Advaita is the necessary conclusion with my other counterpart, soul. Now, this looks very good as a concept. And we have seen a, a, a personality like Sri Ramakrishna can be established in that and he can function from that level. Now, what about us common people? 
uh, will we have to continue to suffer without any relief until we realize and are established in that advaitic experience because until it is an experience it is only a concept an understanding and the understanding will not mitigate my suffering some he gives an answer to this again this is in america one day he tells a lady there i quote some thing madam be broad minded always see two ways when i am on the heights i say shivo ham shivo ham i am he i am he and when i have the stomach ache i say mother have mercy on me it looks funny paradoxical but that is the practical way to face life when i am established in the advaitic consciousness shivo ham shivo ham i am fine everything is okay but when the stomach pains stomach pain seems to be very severe totapuri is an example for that sri ramkrishna's guru one who was established in the highest advaitic knowledge he decides to throw away his body in ganga because his uh, stomach pain is unbearable so when the stomach pain is unbearable swami ji would prefer to say mother have mercy on me now this uh, two options it is kept open for us by vedanta until you are finally established in the highest realization hold on to god surrender to god pray to god simultaneously strive to realize your oneness with this universe they are not two contradictory things in 1899 when calcutta was visited by plague swami vekananda started the first major relief operation such a relief operation of the ramakrishna mission and as part of it he wrote a manifesto plague manifesto i'll be quoting some points from that we can reflect this balance this combination of idealism and practicality this is something swami vivekananda demanded of his disciples the second time when he was living for the west swami ji addressed the monastics at belumat and part of that address he says you must try to combine in your life immense idealism with immense practicality you must be prepared to go into deep meditation now and the next moment you must be ready to go and cultivate these fields you must be prepared to explain the difficult intricacies of the shastras now and the next moment to go and sell the produce of the fields in the market so this kind of a balance practicality and immense idealism this is the way forward for us and in the plague manifesto swami ji gives all these points and let me also give another idea of swami ji before i go into that when uh, swami ji was wandering across india as a parivrajak he met the maharaja of khetri raja ajit singh and this raja asked a wonderful question the very first question he asked swami vivekananda swami ji what is life and at came swami ji's reply swami ji said this is a wonderful definition of life life is the unfoldment and development of a being under circumstances tending to press it down life is the unfoldment and development of a being under circumstances tending to press it down some of it does not categorize the circumstances as good bad anything just factual statement circumstances pressing me down that is a necessary condition for the unfolding and manifesting of life now whatever this pandemic we have is circumstances pressing us down in all possible ways not just one small group of people the whole world is experiencing the circumstances pressing us down and swami ji says this is a necessary condition for life to manifest the best in life will manifest when the circumstances are pressing you down not just the circumstances because uh, there are two things here one is the world outside and the circumstances pressing me down and second is the person inside who is responding to it and the interface between the outside world and the experiencer 
is this identity I have. My identity is the interface between the external circumstances and the inner experiences. This identity, we just read the quotes of Swamiji, if it expands and it breaks out of the limited identity of my body, mind and ego, then the experience is different. It may be a throat cancer, but I don't feel that pain and I don't even feel like trying to cure it. Practical, I had to, he had to take uh, homeopathy medicine, Sri Ramakrishna. He took those medicines. They cleaned his wound. He allowed them to clean his wound. But he said, I cannot put my mind on this. It is with God. So there is a, simultaneously, there is a balance of both. These aspects, like balancing the inside and the outside, it depends on our attitude to these circumstances pressing us down. In general, our attitude is seeing these circumstances as problems or as difficulties. When we say problem, psychologically, there is a mind which says, I don't want to face it. I wish it simply vanishes or someone resolves this problem for me. When I say difficulty, it is a little better because I am ready to face it, but I look for some help. And I pray, I do whatever I want. And some, I look upon someone else to help me. I need some more time. Better than problem. I would say there are two other better attitudes because life is all about attitude. The better attitude than this problem and difficulty is to see the circumstances tending to press us down as a challenge, as an opportunity. They may be mere words, challenge and opportunity, but the mindset behind that makes all the difference. When I see these circumstances pressing me down as a challenge, or when I see them better still as an opportunity, something different manifests inside. The experiencer is transformed. The interface changes. Now, in his plague manifesto, Swamiji gives us some clues which we can use for these present conditions, which I think we all know will be going on for another one year or so. We are just seeing probably new faces of it, especially in our country, in India. I'll just read out the key aspects of this plague manifesto. First, Swamiji declares, Brothers of Calcutta, we feel happy when you are happy. We suffer when you suffer. Therefore, during these days of extreme adversity, we are striving and ceaselessly praying for your welfare and an easy way to save you from disease and the fear of an epidemic. Immediately you will see that. Yes, I depend on God. I will pray to God. But simultaneously, he says, we are trying to work out an easy way to resolve it. That easy way is the practicality of using my common sense, using the buddhi that the divine will has implanted in me to work out a way. And I will feel oneness with others when I start praying for them. We pray for others. This is the second message from this. First, I am going to look out for an easy way, a practical way to save us all from this problem. For us now, it is like wear your face mask, Try to keep that uh, physical distance when you go out. Try that as much as possible. Each of us, we are having this responsibility. It's a practical response. Second one, somebody says, we are praying for you. This is one key factor for all of us now. Anyone who wants to contribute in some way, even sitting at home, he says, pray for others. This praying for others, if we can make it a everyday practice, praying for all those frontline workers, the doctors, the nurses, the hospital staff, uh, our uh, security people, police and others. And there are many patients who have now bereaved, they have become orphans, they have lost their husbands, children, parents. If we can just pray for all of those who are suffering, that prayer will help me, will help them. Because finally we are all united. And my heart, wholehearted prayer growing from here is bound to add to that universal. This. Uh, uh, flow of uh, peace and that benevolent, uh, this thing which is awakened in all the human beings by, by the will of the God. So this is second answer that Swamiji gives. Pray for others. Pray to God. He says, we humbly pray to you. Please do not panic. 
due to unfounded fear depend upon god and calmly try to find the best means to solve the problem repeatedly he combines them together depend upon god and then calmly try to find the best means to solve the problem if you cannot do that join hands with those who are doing that very thing so it is a call for collective action first depend upon god simultaneously calmly try to find the best solution possible if you cannot do this join hands with others who are working to find answers to the solution don't be an obstacle you don't be a problem yourself next he says if that grave disease fearing which both the high and the low rich and the poor are all fleeing the city ever really comes in our midst then even if we perish while serving and nursing you we will consider ourselves fortunate because you are all embodiments of god he who thinks otherwise out of vanity superstition or ignorance offends god incurs great sin there is not the slightest doubt about it simultaneously we practice advaita shiva gnana jeeva seva i try to see the lord in everyone i try to see myself in others i try to be practical also i worship god and i depend on myself also then he says what is there to fear he says yeah, the british are trying to do to alleviate your this thing you don't have to fear so much it is not taken a very big fall don't be so panic panic sticker try to see reality because if you listen to rumors then you start thinking millions are dying he says the next one next point he says is do not give way to any rumors pay no heed to rumors that is exact words then he says come let us give up this false fear and having faith in the infinite compassion of god gird up our loins and enter the field of action so there is a call give up false fear give up this fear which he says is cowardly and then have faith in god then enter the field of action then he makes one more point let us live pure and clean lives this is fear of an epidemic etc will vanish into thin air by his grace there is a very important point that swami ji makes here he says yes pray to god depend on yourself look for practical means simultaneously he says you have to restrain yourself i read those words during this period of epidemic then it was plague epidemic now it is a pandemic abstain from anger and from lust even if you are householders this we know yoga sutra also tells us each time we suppress hatred or a feeling of anger or any other such energy as manifesting as lust also it is so much good energy stored up in our favor and that piece of energy will be converted into the higher powers again yoga sutra tells us the chaste brain has tremendous energy and gigantic will power so samaji tells us even if you are householders at this period of time abstain from anger and lust conserve that energy because you have a great challenge facing you from outside circumstances then he makes one point oh he says be ethical in conduct in chart what somebody says is be ethical in conduct it looks like this is not the time to talk about ethics but somebody is pointing it out that your inner practice is going to reflect in the world outside because the whole universe is running on the dharma the law of dharma and anything that is against the dharma it will have a repercussion at the individual level at the cosmic level planir bhavati bharata so this problem what we are facing now if we look at it from the advaitic point of view we say it is nothing but you see from a little lower point of view yes probably there is a moral lapse dharma has somewhere been violated so my response now will be immediately as an individual i try to be more ethical more moral 
abstain from anger and lust and pray for others surrender to god try to be immensely practical also in short what swamiji is telling here is very uh, practical first he is telling keep your environment clean that's a practical advice he gives in this he says always keep the house and its premises rooms floors bed drain etc clean next he tells physical strength so he is asking us to strengthen the body he tells in this manifesto do not eat stale spoiled food take fresh and nutritious food instead a weak body is more susceptible to disease same thing doctors are telling us if your immune system is strong you will be asymptomatic you will not have any problems much problems next he tells to build the mental energy mental strength always keep the mind cheerful this is word always keep the mind cheerful everyone will die once cowards suffer the pangs of death again and again solely due to the fear in their own minds so he says be cheerful have mental strength then character strength that is the point i touched fear never leaves those who earn their livelihoods by unethical means or who cause harm to others therefore at this time when we face the great fear of death desist from all such behavior next he asked for sustaining and strengthening the psychic energy that is abstaining from anger and lust even if you are householders and then very practical idea he gives try to follow reliable sources the last point he says is do not pay any heed to rumors now we are told don't go by your whatsapp forwards do not pay any heed to rumor 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 is there any time is 100 years before or even now and finally he says the mother of the universe is herself the support of the helpless the mother is assuring us fear not fear not this is a short message of swami vivekananda packed with practical application of vedanta what i should do for my individual understanding of this situation for my individual course of action and for the collective the society also what we should do as a group of people together we should be immensely idealistic immensely practical depend on god pray to god simultaneously look out for answers practical ways of coming out of this problem collectively and for that one good solution for beginning is pray intensely for yourself pray for others practice all these practical ideas for your personal this thing and try to implement it help others to practice it as much as they can in their personal lives this and that background of swamiji's definition of life if you keep in mind we will have more deaths probably in our country across the world some of this pandemic has now come close we have quite a few deaths among our circles of devotees even monastics we have lost a few swamis to this pandemic disease and there are thousands who are dying and it has come close to almost every one of us either a one of our family distant family or friends it has touched them all now and it will become more the solution is the idea which swami ji gives in this manifesto hold on pray to god this is a challenge the best way is to see it also as an opportunity to increase our faith in ourselves look inside and have a higher dimension for our individual identity if i continue with this identity that i am this body i am this mind i am this ego then there is no real solution for this problem it will be a problem if i can awaken the higher dimension then death is no longer a death in that context i am reminded once a group of college students came to meet some vivekananda in peruma and he told them meditate on death meditate on death it looks uh, very pessimistic on the face of it but when we practice it it makes a difference somebody himself tells that initially it will make you depressive morose you will feel very bad you continue for some weeks somebody says then you see your perception of life changes if i am not afraid of death then what but i should be rooted in moral moral practices and in the higher uh, power uh, understanding that we as manifest inside and outside and if i can do this then the suffering which is coming will not be a real uh, disturbance for uh, 
my spiritual progress or even my engagement with world in whatever form of service activity i am doing livelihood or any work i do it will have a different dimension because it is part of life suffering death is part of life only i don't have to suffer it if the person inside the identity is transformed these are some ideas that uh, some of you can and the juices in the big manifesto i just wanted to share them with you if i have any questions i'll be happy to <coughs> hello yes professor so, okay okay namaste namaste so thank you maharaj Uh, for your beautiful presentation actually you have uh, presented the uh, advaita vedanta view of swami vivekananda and you have mentioned some very technical points uh, like uh, infinite universal the basic point of suffering sufferings physical identity and spiritual identity you have differentiated in your speech and you also have pointed out the plague situation of 1899 and uh, very significantly pointed out the plague manifesto made by swami vivekananda particularly the jivan darshan or the philosophy of life that swami vivekananda wanted to teach or preach has also been addressed and finally the practical aspect of uh, that is practical vedanta how we can in what way we can make use of the knowledge propagated by swami vivekananda to to uh, to adapt in this situation adapt ourselves in this situation and one thing is very serious in 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 contemporary time that we don't have to pay uh, any attention to the rumor uh, we it is not essential to allow ourselves to be swept away by the rumor so a very beautiful presentation i once again would like to thank you for presenting swami vivekananda's view actually from the point of vedanta so now we may go to take one or two questions if any question is there hello how did swami ji give emphasis on mass education to eliminate darkness of mind as well as to self how did swami ji give emphasis on mass education to eliminate darkness of mind yeah swami ji wanted to educate the masses uh, is that the question you are asking and the krishna mantri hotel has a question uh, mass education to eliminate darkness of mind as well as to self i don't catch that clearly swami ji uh, identified two reasons for the downfall of india first he said is the neglect of the masses and second is the oppression of women swami ji was very clear about it he says india is suffering of because of these two main reasons you have oppressed women and the masses neglected the masses to make sure that you do undo this india will rise up like anything so the educating the masses was from his uh, dream also he wanted an education on nationalistic lines and he said you know, so, so he wanted sanyasis to go out he said go with a globe in your hand go with that magic lantern go to these people give them the latest geography science help them give them technology help them to see the better side of life because shri ramakrishna was uh, say kali pete dharm hoy na so he held on to that he says you cannot go and preach religion to people for suffering to have a two pieces uh, square meals a day so that he wanted and with that he said spirituality is in the backbone of india give them this higher idea because superstitions and other things have come that will automatically take care of itself but he would not work it out he gave the ideas we are still working it out and swami ji was advaitic too but it is also like uh, what uh, it's a combination of all these ideas that we have in our religious tradition in all the different ways in this plague manifesto the last point in nota bena he writes in order to remove the fear of the epidemic you should sing nama sankirtanam every evening in every locality 
Sutra, it is not simply Advait. He says, do Nama Sankirtanam everywhere. So have faith in God and it is something which immediately will give you results. Because the common people, you cannot go and give them Vedantic concepts. You get them, you lead them in the Sankirtan. And if they have faith, that faith will translate also in a faith in themselves. And that should give them the strength to face whatever adversities they are facing now in our present condition. Too. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj Pranam. Thank you, thank you, sir, you. and thank you, Maharaj, for such an enriching and thoughtful for such an enriching and thoughtful session. Now we are moving on to our final session of the day. In this session, we have amongst us a very eminent speaker, Dr. Kenneth R. Valpe. I would request Dr. Sheikh, sir, kindly introduce our speaker, Dr. Kenneth R. Valpe, and kindly take over the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, I would like to namaskar. Uh, I would like to welcome Swagatam Kenneth Valpeji to this uh, noted webinar. Uh, Kenneth Valpeji is a PhD, is a research fellow of Oxford Center for Hindu Studies and member of Bhakti Vedanta Research Center. Academic Advisory Board. I would like to welcome him to deliver his presentation. He is going to tell about between William Blake and the Bhagavad Gita, rebooting the imagination for troubled time. After listening to the Advaita Vedanta perspective and the perspective of Swami Vivekananda, uh, respected Kenneth Valpi will tell us, uh, he will I think he will make a bridge between Bhagavad Gita, the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita and William Black. So you are most welcome uh, to deliver your presentation. Swagatam and Namaskar. Please. Thank you so much, Dr. Islam. Um, I'm happy to see you again. Uh, I was fortunate to meet you, I think it was about two years ago in Kolkata. And it's so nice uh, to be with you again, although in these circumstances, it's not ideal. I also want to thank our organizers, uh, especially Dr. Goswami has been putting in so much effort the last several days, uh, <laughs> bringing all of this together. Uh, and I want to say how much I appreciate uh, everyone helping in the background, uh, and also the presentations that uh, have uh, been presented so far today, I find ver very fascinating. Now, let's see if we get the technology. I have a PowerPoint here, and uh, I need to ask, first of all, whether this is vis visible. If I can get some indication. Uh, that this uh, this uh, presentation of PowerPoint is visible, perhaps by WhatsApp, that would be helpful. In any case, I'll just begin speaking. Um, William Bla Blake may seem a very unlikely person uh, to to reference to speak about in this conference. Uh, and uh, I hope to show how he might be re relevant uh, for our, our theme. And at the same time, I want to say that uh, this is very much exploratory. Um, I am particularly interested in the notion of imagination and how this may be relevant in uh, what we call broadly spiritual life, as we heard from uh, Dr. Brew. Uh, and as I'm saying in the title, I want to try to make a link uh, with the Bhagavad Gita 
And uh, historians tell us that William Blake most probably uh, encountered the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, there is some evidence uh, that he, he was aware of this text and there are traces of indication that, uh, reflecting in his writing from the Bhagavad Gita. I won't be going into detail about that, uh, but uh, what I'm hoping to show is that uh, by highlighting this connection, uh, we can see something of the limitations of prevailing forms of thinking and imagination uh, to address the stressful psychological conditions of our time. So I want to say I'm uh, attempting, uh, aiming to show a direction. Uh, Excuse me, sir, yes. sorry for interrupting. Could you please, yeah. uh, could you please share your PowerPoint by minimizing your screen? We can't um, okay, I was hoping that I'm doing that, but I see now I yes, have to uh, minimize can't see this. That. Uh, you can okay. minimize your screen and share the PowerPoint and open the PowerPoint in the slideshow mode. Uh, do yes, you sir. see it now? No, do sir. No, it? sir. Okay. So if you can then... kindly minimize your screen, the right yes, now the screen, this... minimize it yeah, and this... show the PowerPoint. I I did minimize the screen. Um, however, and... I'm sorry if this is not showing now. Um, so there must be some trick which I thought we had worked out, but uh, I'm not getting it. Um, can you give some further points? Because I minimized the screen and I uh, have set it for PowerPoint. Maybe I should restart it. Share screen. And PowerPoint, do you see it now? Still uh, not, huh? No, okay, no, that, sir. All right. Uh, in that case, I will simply speak and. <laughs> uh, PowerPoint I can go ahead. Um, we don't completely depend on this. I can simply go ahead and speak. Otherwise, we spend too much time, I think. So um, my aim is uh, that we can show a direction toward human empowerment through imagination. And the way I'm doing this is by taking William Blake's four levels of imagination and vision as a kind of springboard and challenge uh, to stretch our powers of imagination through the aid of the Bhagavad Gita's bhakti regenerative vision uh, and process of human empowerment uh, to be, as is said in the sixth chapter of the Gita, to be never shaken even in the midst of the greatest difficulty. Yasmin sito na dukke na guru na pi vichayate. But we, before we go to Mr. Blake, I want to refer to, <clears throat> to two modern psychologists, uh, Christopher Peterson and Martin Seligman, uh, who are uh, involved in this uh, very modern study of what is called positive psychology. And in one of their works, they identified various strengths of character, strengths uh, of virtue. And uh, the last category of these they include is called strengths of transcendence. And they list five strengths of transcendence and what 
I want to do is come back to these after uh, visiting Mr. Blake and the Gita and see what we can appreciate about them. Uh, these five are uh, these five strengths of transcendence are appreciation of beauty, gratitude, hope, humor, and spirituality. And they elaborate; these scholars elaborate on definitions of each of each of these and how these may relate uh, to positive psychology. All right, William Blake uh, was a mm, artist, a poet, and a visionary uh, living from 1757 to 1827. And he has been identified with what's come to be called the romantic cultural movement of Europe uh, of the time. Uh, and uh, in the midst of that, he very much opposed uh, the prevailing zeitgeist, the prevailing mentality of the time that privileged reason and deplored imagination, even regarding it as dangerous. Uh, so this was the, the mood of the time. Science is everything. Imagination uh, can be even dangerous. For Blake, imagination, in contrast, was the central faculty of both God and humans. Imagination is central. So Blake uh, had this idea of imagination as existing essentially on four levels. And uh, he had special names for each of these. Uh, the first is, uh, according to his mythographic, his myth, mythological thinking, uh, his own creative mythology. So the first, and we can say lowest level of imagination and vision, he calls Ulro. And this is the reality of quantity. I'll elaborate on each of these, but first I'll go through the four. The second, he simply calls generation. This is the reality of production and reproduction. Then the third, which is a more luminous level of imagination and vision, he calls Beulah. This is the reality of relationships. And finally, his fourth, uh, level, he has two names. One is Eden, and the other is eternity, and this is the reality of transcendence. So now I will uh, elaborate briefly on each of these, and then I will get back to this um, fivefold strengths of transcendence. So Ul Ulro, we can say, represents scientism. Uh, he painted or engra engra engraved a picture of Newton very much absorbed in measuring uh, some, something on a scroll of paper. Um, this is the belief that all and only scientifically gained knowledge is true and real. And we may see how this is manifest today in this circumstance of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, as uh, the preoccupation and concern with metrics, statistics of people infected, numbers of people dying as a result of the disease, financial loss calculations, graphs and charts of trends and projections, uh, and so on and so forth. So forth. This becomes uh, very much uh, foremost in the news uh, today. We may venture a comparison of Blake's idea uh, of this lower level of consciousness 
of vision, of, uh, of imagination, with what we find uh, Krishna describing in the Bhagavad Gita as tamoguna. Some features of tamoguna he refers to, especially in the 14th chapter, are that it is uh, born of ignorance, uh, ajnanajam, that it is delusive, mohanam, that it is accompanied by madness, pramadha. Uh, so, and generally we understand tamagun in terms of the notion of darkness and of ignorance. So Blake was saying that our preoccupation with numbers, our preoccupation with counting uh, is problematic uh, because, in fact, there is no vision there. There is no imagination. Uh, there is no uh, real uh, ability to approach freedom uh, from misery. His second level of consciousness uh, he called generation. Uh, and to this form, uh, to this level, he identified a particular figure he called Los. Los was uh, a person who he portrayed as carrying a large uh, iron hammer. Uh, and he, this Los character was bound by what he called the chain of jealousy the chain of jealousy. Uh, this generation level is characterized by the spirit of reproduction. And uh, we may say, jumping ahead of his time, uh, of the Darwinian struggle for life, uh, for which uh, uh, this is a somewhat expanded imagination with some awareness of cycles and seasons and whereby um, prominent come the uh, focus on manufacture and farming. Manufacture and farming become a central foci uh, of this level. Uh, but further, <laughs> Uh, Blake, with his very fertile imagination, uh, uh, considered Los as what he called the great spirit signifying mankind's imaginative force put to action. He labors to build a utopia of frenetic activity and Blake had a name for this utopia. He called it Golgonuza. And he, he drew what looks very much like a yantra, a four-sided yantra with de many details of uh, the elements of this Gol Golgonuza. And he superimposed it on uh, the city of London of his time. Uh, he was a resident of London. Mm. Uh, and with this uh, general idea of generation, uh, he is, we can say, presenting essentially in relation to Bhagavad Gita, a parallel with what Krishna refers to as Rajaguna uh, from, of course, the Sankhya tradition. Rajaguna is the quality of energy and passion, uh, which Krishna refers to in chapter 14 of the Gita as Trishna Sangha Samud Bhavam, born of association with hankering. Uh, it brings great attachment, uh, fruitive or selfish mentality, intense endeavor, an uncontrollable desire, hankering, and greed. Uh, and so, because of being rajasic of this um, mode, we can say of Blake's idea 
Los may be re represented uh, today in global industry, the military industrial complex, as it was called by a former US president, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, the transnational corporation or corporate uh, conglomerate that now strangles the world and accelerates Anthropocene environmental devastation, climate catastrophe, and zoonotic disease. And hence, because of all of this, an increase of global anxiety. Well, uh, oh, so much for the second level. We go to the third level of Blake's uh, uh, levels, four levels of imagination and vision. And again, he called this Beulah. And this is the realm of the subconscious, and it's the realm of awareness for a desire, awareness of a desire for relationships. Uh, the prominent emotions here are more luminous, we can say, sympathy, care, sensitivity, happiness, love, and affection, and later, scholar has suggested he shows uh, interest here blake shows that this level is indicating the i thou uh, relationality uh, this becomes prominent over the i it non-relationality of course this is uh, coming from uh, martin buber's philosophy later philosophy and another positive feature of this level uh, is an increased sense of justice, uh, of justice and fairness, uh, which is all very good. And so on this level, we may speak of a parallel with Krishna's description of sattva guna, uh, characterized by piety, illumination, a sense of happiness, increased knowledge and awareness, and a lifestyle including eating habits conducive to increased duration of life. Ayu sattva balarogya sukha priti vivardhanaha. And and I think there's a significant parallel with sattva guna. However, Krishna in the Gita speaks about how sattva guna is also a guna. It is a, uh, a conditioned state. And we see this also reflected, I find, in, uh, in, in Blake's work. Um, yes, uh, in, in this third level, uh, there is now a focus on relationships, including an intimation of a connection with divinity, but on this third level, Blake calls Beulah, hmm, there is a downward sliding tendency toward control of relationships, which leads to oppression instead of justice and fairness. And what do we see manifest in our wider world today an expanding worldwide culture of surveillance. And this, again, is bringing increased anxiety and distrust, and I would suggest it's accompanied by a proliferation uh, of conspiracy theories. <laughs> uh, we, we heard how Swami Vivekananda said, don't listen to rumors. <laughs> So now we have rumors expanding all over um, by the internet, and this is causing only more anxiety. So summarizing, I would say uh, uh, that Blake summarizes these the three levels. Uh, he says in his poetic language, 
uh, referring to the people who are subjected to the three gunas. Uh, he says, they wander moping in their heart, a sun, a dreary moon, a universe of fiery constellations in their brain, an earth of wintry woe beneath their feet and round their loins, waters or winds or clouds or brooding lightnings and pestilential plagues. So his last reference to pestilential plagues is, of course, relevant. Uh, on the fourth, fourth level, uh, which again he refers to as Eden or eternity, imagination now goes beyond the mere speculative to the generative to yogic connection with divinity with the supreme person, the source of all being and becoming. This level includes the best of the first three levels of imagination, uh, because each of those levels he gives some credit for. Uh, the first, Ulro, he gives value in discernment. In the second level, generation, he gives value to expansiveness. And for the third level, uh, Blake gives value to feeling. But on this fourth level, the cosmos is alive. It is pluriform. It is a vision crucial to the sense of hope enabling actions to become what Krishna calls koshala, skillful, artistic, bringing about welfare for all. Again, going back to uh, Krishna's summary in chapter 14 of attitudes uh, of one who is transcendent to the three gunas, I think, again, this rep uh, resonates well uh, with Blake's fourth stage of imagination and vision. Summarizing this, uh, Krishna says, being undisturbed by illumination, attachment, delusion, when these are present, that's the three gunas, nor longing for them when they disappear. Being with equal vision amidst the dualities of this world, including the personal experiences of being honored or dishonored. So there we have a, a sketch of, of Blake's vision. I'm trying to juxtapose them uh, with Bhagavad Gita for the purpose of focusing, highlighting on this notion of imagination. Uh, but now let's go back to modern uh, psychological thought and uh, the notion of psychological well being in relation to imagination. Uh, I want to suggest that this parallel can uh, bring us to a better understanding of collective imagination as it works negatively in the present time and point, pointing toward uh, the higher level uh, of liberative, liberating imagination. Uh, so again, Christopher Peterson and Martin Seligman in their positive psychological study titled Character, Strengths and Virtues, a Handbook and Classification, list five types of strengths of transcendence. And these are, again, appreciation of beauty, gratitude, hope, humor, and spirituality. And what I want to suggest is that what, um, what makes each of these components of uh, the strength of transcendence, what makes them a strength 
is an awakening of our power of imagination, but what sort of imagination? That we understand, I believe, in such uh, sacred texts as the Bhagavad Gita. Um, he is showing how to cultivate transcendent imagination. Uh, and, and, and specifically in the Bhagavad Gita, I would call attention to a particular verse we don't usually think of in terms of imagination. This is in the 18th chapter, Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma Nasochati Nakanchati Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Labhate Param. One who is thus transcendental, transcendentally situated, at once realizes the Supreme Brahman and becomes fully joyful. He never laments or desires to have anything. Such a person is equally disposed toward every living being. In that state, such a person attains pure devotion unto me. And finally, I want to uh, share a short poem by William Blake that I think also points in this direction. Uh, it's uh, a simple kind of poem. I believe he wrote it fairly early in his career. It's from his Songs of Innocence and Experience. And this is from the section called uh, Songs of Innocence. And the title of the poem is The Divine Image. And it goes like this. To mercy, pity, peace, and love, all pray in their distress. And to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. For mercy, pity, peace, and love is God our Father dear. And mercy, pity, peace, and love is man his child and care. For mercy has a human heart, pity a human face and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. Then every man of every clime that, pray, that prays in his distress, prays to the human form divine, love, mercy, pity, peace. And all must love the human form in heathen, Turk or Jew, where mercy, love, and pity dwell, there God is dwelling too. So I will end there. And uh, again, I want to thank our organizers and hosts. And if there is some question or discussion, I'll be happy to try to respond. Okay. Namaskar. And it was really a very thought-provoking speech delivered by Kenneth Valpi. Thank you very much for giving us, for taking us to a completely new discourse that addresses William Blake and Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I really would like to appreciate the approach that you have made to present your speech, that is ex exploratory approach. Particularly, we have noticed that uh, the four levels of consciousness of William Blake is presented in her speech, in his speech. Uh, the four levels are Ulro, Generation, Beulah, Eden or Eternity. So it's a, it's a kind of topographic uh, representation of Blake's four levels of imagination, which is really very interesting. And another point you have also 
uh, shown as some PowerPoint, uh, which one slide shows the outline of Yantra and the geographical boundary of London. So this correlation is also very, very interesting. Uh, you also have pointed out the Darwinian struggle of life. Uh, so these are uh, some of the main, these were some of the main points of your presentation. And finally, uh, with reference to Srimad Bhagavad Gita, you have quoted from uh, Pashtadasa Dhyaya, the Moksha Yoga, Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma no Sochati no Kangshati. So the correlation between William Blake and Bhagavad Gita is really interesting. So now I would request uh, if there is any question uh, from the participant, please. Any question is there? Yeah, uh, there are okay. uh, a few questions actually. Uh, okay. Professor Malpe, uh, one question which has come from Dr. Tindi Goswami is how can we relate Blake's idea on sorrow with the teachings of Bhagavad Gita? Mm. Your take on it? <laughs> yes, uh, a good question. I need to emphasize. Uh, <laughs> and be a little confessional that um, uh, the, the short notice for giving this presentation didn't allow me to go into the depth I wanted to. Um, of course, starting from the side of the Gita, uh, Krishna, uh, this is his very first instruction to Arjuna, Arjuna in chapter two, Asochan uh, Anvasochas Tong Pragya Vadangs Chabhasit. Basasi, Gatasun, Akatasun, Na Anusochanti, Pandita, Na Anusochanti, do not lament, do not uh, be sorrowful. But he's saying, Anusochanti, do not go on being sorrowful. Um, he doesn't say, be like a stone and not feel for those who are suffering. Um, but uh, he's, of course, pointing Arjuna in uh, to the transcendent level from step one. He's making this very uh, strong point of this distinction between self and body, uh, which, which then he elaborates essentially throughout the Gita. So from my little uh, knowledge and understanding of of William Blake, I would just point again, he's, he is uh, the, the level of, of consciousness that he is uh, interested in in particular is this fourth level. Uh, but if we think about this in terms of imagination, uh, this, is the, this is the key, I think, to making this connection when Krishna says, uh, Brahma Buddha Prasannatma, na sochati na kangshati. Well, we can start out um, by imagining the possibility of experiencing not lamenting. We can exercise that uh, faculty of our imagination. What would that be like? What would it be like to not be hankering for things which I don't have or for conditions which are not there? What would that be like? That I'm suggesting uh, through Blake is, uh, is an activation of our imagination to the point that it becomes reality. Uh, and um, Blake saw imagination as, in a certain way, certain sense, equivalent to God. <laughs> he he was so much the opposite of uh, uh, the spirit of his times, where reason prevailed. Uh, he said, "No, imagination is what makes us human, and it's what makes us divine." Uh, and so 
to connect with the Gita in this way, uh, I think is helpful. Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu. What would it, what could it be like to actually see all living beings equally? <laughs> not just theoretically and not just, you know, I can quote Bhagavad Gita. That's very nice, but to actually, so that requires a kind of awakening of our uh, imagination, which can lead then to realization. Yeah, and uh, uh, Professor Islam, if I may just proceed with the other questions as well. Yes. Yeah. So if other questions are yes. there, yes, please. Uh, the second question was from my side. Uh, I found the words which were used okay. by Blake to be uh, pretty interesting. For example, the uh, the word Golgonuza, which uh, he had used, is uh, it has some parallels with perhaps the biblical concept of uh, Golgotha, uh, because I'm not sure, but <laughs> it, it seemed like they rhymed in a sense. And uh, secondly, the concept of Beulah also had uh, 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 something of the surveillance state mechanism, which Bentham speaks about in his idea of the panopticon. So if, ah. uh, if you could, could just elaborate on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, I'm going to show my ignorance, but uh, I think it's very possible that there is uh, some conscious connection of Golganuza with uh, Golgotha, uh, but I wouldn't be able to say without first consulting the, the references. There's actually a, a dictionary of terms uh, that uh, Blake used. Uh, there's a whole dictionary uh, because he used such a, a, a strange uh, terminology and I could get back to you after looking at that, <laughs> but for sure, now sure, I can't sure. say. No the, the general point though is he identified himself very much as a Christian. Uh, and this was one reason I wanted to bring this in, uh, to bring him into this assembly because I understood this should, uh, sh should be an interreligious uh, discussion. And I wanted yeah. to explore like this. Uh, he was, however, no traditional Christian. He was a radical. He was what was called a dissenter. Um, he yeah. was also politically very radical. Um, he's a very colorful character <laughs> in so many ways. Uh, but this relation yeah. to Bentham's uh, panopticon, that, that would be another interesting and possibly rich comparison. Uh, I hadn't thought of that. Thank you for bringing it, bringing it up. Welcome. welcome. Uh, there, was, there was also another question, Professor Valpi, uh, but I can't find it just at the present. If uh, Srimanthi, can you locate the third question, which is there? And please relay it to Professor sir? Valpi. Yeah. Yes, sir. The third question is from Dr. Shormishta Debasu. She's asking, if anyone does not believe in spirituality, then how Blake's idea can enhance him to become influenced? <laughs> um, it, it may not be possible if a person is determined uh, to not accept that there is such a reality beyond what Krishna would refer to as the three gunas. Uh, but I think here we can be helped by again uh, something Krishna says in uh, the beginning of chapter, uh, is it 14 or seven, 17? I think he says, Shraddha Mayo Yang Purusho. The, uh, the Purusha, the living being, is Shraddha Maya, is full of faith, is constituted of faith. Now, where is that faith invested is another question. Um, but uh, often we, we, we hear of the atheist saying, I have no faith in, in God. All right, but you do have faith in something. Where is that invested uh, may help you to see uh, how it can be advanced. 
And I think, again, going back to Blake's um, uh, in putting such importance on imagination, maybe not Blake's imagination in particular, but giving space for uh, the imaginative power to comprehend the possibility of transcendence of spirituality uh, may lead such a person forward. Okay, so we, our time is already over, so I would like to congratulate both the speakers, Swami Mahamedhananda ji and Kenneth Valpe ji for presenting their beautiful and thought-provoking lecture. Uh, I just uh, would like to again congratulate the Kolkata Society for Asian Studies and BRC for organizing this very eventful, interesting program. And Ferdinand Sardella, in his speech, wanted to mention that modern science is lacking the ability to explain certain things. At least this seminar wanted to find out some question with regard to spirituality, with regard to the sacred text associated with this. I think this is going to be a milestone in the academic. So with these few words, I would like to hand over the microphone to uh, for the next uh, presentation or announcement. Thank you, sir. Due to paucity of uh, time, we didn't take up um, one more question. But if uh, sir has, uh, OK, uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, all the, I would like to thank all the four speakers and our esteemed moderators for the wonderful and thoughtful sessions that we uh, you know, experienced today. Uh, Tomorrow will tomorrow will be the second day for the international webinar. The day start like the session starts from 6 p.m. The YouTube link to all the participants will be mailed today after the session gets over. Thank you, thank you for attending today's session, and we hope to see you all tomorrow again. Thank you.